Sometimes the best teaching we do is an act of deception. It's a kind of magic show where we tell a story using sounds, images, and ideas. We live in an impossible world. Pressure and problems are everywhere. We are micromanaged in school and in the workplace. And even when you learn to manage the difficulties of being a student, looking around, it's easy to see a whole world of other problems you'll eventually have to deal with. There is deforestation. There are islands of floating plastic in the Pacific. Vanishing species and innumerable forms of social injustice. The list is endless, and often we feel like our lives are not our own. Directed and often deceived by people and institutions we may or may not even be familiar with. When we take the time to think about all these troubles, it can easily lead us to feelings of individual hopelessness in the face of them. The right kind of teaching, I think, can help us avoid these feelings. The Penrose Triangle is an impossible object. It is a three-dimensional projection that cannot exist in real space. It plays with our mind's tendency to attempt to make three-dimensional objects from false visual cues in a two-dimensional space. The error in how we see works, I think, as a pretty good visual metaphor for our habit of trusting in social institutions that sometimes deceive us and create some of the problems I've mentioned. An example of what I mean might help. In the waterfall, up here, M.C. Escher used two impossible Penrose triangles side by side to help explain an impossible machine. Can everybody see the two triangles? Defined by the waterfall at the base. It's a machine that once started, never stops, a perpetual motion machine. The invention of such a machine has been attempted by many, but never successfully, because it violates basic laws of thermodynamics. In the case of Escher's waterfall, the water would eventually evaporate, and the grinding stone attached to the water wheel stop. Interestingly, Escher's fictional architecture is one of industry a mill for grinding corn or generating energy, perhaps. Aside from giving us an entertaining optical illusion, was Escher trying to say something more? We might ask ourselves if this visual deception of a mechanical impossibility is a useful metaphor to help explain a particular industry deception. From state of the art, to falling apart. The industry practice of planned obsolescence is a deception. Companies advertise quality and durability, yet design products to fail in order to sell us more. We're convinced by slick advertising to keep buying without thinking much about where the natural resources are going. So we might ask ourselves, where is the connection between Escher's water wheel and this common practice of planned obsolescence? Well, like the water pictured in Escher's impossible perpetual motion machine, the resources we use will eventually dry up and the wheels of industry will eventually stop. It's important to remember that the deception <coughs> of the Penrose Triangle is a natural tendency of the brain. We are not just innocent bystanders, but participate in the illusion. And if we extend the metaphor to include the part all of us play, we as consumers are willing participants in the drama. We enjoy our comforting illusions. We put hope in this Mobius strip variation on the Penrose Triangle and give lip service to the three R's of reuse, sorry, reduce, reuse, and recycle, which is undoubtedly a step in the right direction. But the reality 
is that many of us are more easily drawn into the more destructive cycle of crave, consume, and chuck. Chuck, for those of you who don't know, means to throw away. Granted, we are driven by false industry promises, promoted by advertising. Advertising that appeals to, as Edward Bernays correctly demonstrated, subconscious desires. But it should be obvious to everyone that we play our part in this. So, in the classroom, how do we combat the institutions and society that are misleading and destructive? <clears throat> well, one thing that I've found useful in my classes is something called critical pedagogy. This was uh, developed by a number of writers, but one in particular, one uh, Pablo um, Freyr, who was a Brazilian educator who looked at institutions in society. And how institutions relate to each other, how institutions relate to individuals, and how individuals relate to each other, and particularly in terms of power in society. So what he did was he came up with different teaching strategies that would enable students to um, first recognize these relationships, then to question them, and then if need be, to try and reform them to bring about a more just society. Now, I've chosen this image as uh, this kind of triangular arrangement um, just as a way to maybe help clarify um, the relationships that we have. Um, we have the teachers up in the boat, as I see it, uh, the vulnerable students down in the water who need help, and the institutions um, that practice sometimes quite destructive deception. But distinguishing the truth <clears throat> from the lies is difficult. When we think about something like consumerism and how it so completely dominates our lives, how often do you buy things every day? How many of those things do you really need versus how many you just want? And how often do you buy things and like a child after Christmas, bored with your toys, just put them away never to use them again? Think about how our satisfaction in life depends on having things, status, feelings of belonging, entertainment, and comfort. So, maybe we can help students more by practicing something like what the advertising industry already does. What if we take a page from their game? What if, in order to lead students to see the disparities of power and advantage in the world, we start lying to the students as well? That seemed like a good idea out there. What do you guys think? Should teachers begin lying to students? Think of deception in this sense. We might <clears throat> practice in the classroom as a kind of vaccination. Um, to be completely, completely clear, everybody here is um, aware of what a vaccination is exactly, right? It's where we introduce a small, inactivated um, sample of a pathogen into our systems. The hope being that the, um, the inactivated pathogen will help to build our immune systems, to strengthen them. And by analogy, I'm suggesting that we lie to students as a way to help prepare them and strengthen their critical skills for when they come into contact with more destructive social deceptions. For instance, as a way of introducing the previous concept of planned obsolescence when I teach this in class, I might begin a discussion by stating that money does, in fact, bring happiness. And therefore, the pursuit of it is always justified. I present this idea to the students as if I'm actually invested in it, as if I actually believe it. The idea, of course, is that the students will react in a contrary way to this obviously radical position, especially if our previous interactions in the class have led the students to believe that I actually am against this idea. In another class, um, I teach about something called colony collapse disorder. 
Now, this is um, a, a recent problem in uh, Europe and in North America. Um, there have been um, mass die-offs of millions of bees in apiculture. Um, and uh, there are different possible explanations for why this is happening. Some people think that it's diet. Maybe they're not getting the kind of food that they used to get. Some people argue that pesticides are involved. Um, and others yet suggest that perhaps parasites, or even maybe that a combination of these three problems is what's involved. One of the large agrochemical companies wrote a small book that targeted children to educate them about the use of their product to help bees. The information was obviously one-sided. So I bring it into class and I present it to the students as just an informative public service announcement when we read it. After, I ask the students who they think would have published the book. I draw their attention to a small logo down in the corner and suggest that they do some uh, research on it. And I give them a uh, research assignment to look up information related to the company having specifically to do with bees. The discussion on the following day is often pretty interesting. Some students come in with uh, very different information. Some get only information that the company published. Others get uh, more controversial information. And it helps to generate a very interesting discussion. OK, so what's the point of doing this? A calculated dishonesty. Why would you know, what's the objective here? So um, the first objective is because the deception allows the students to discover the information on their own and whatever, whatever problems might be related to it. It teaches them to question even the teacher and thereby to see the value of assessing all information regardless of the source. Because it simulates being lied to. They experience the lie firsthand and then go through the steps of receiving the information, challenging the lie. And finally, in a class, they can help each other see shared cultural deceptions. Now, Plato talked about two kinds of lies. In the Republic, Plato talks about two kinds of lies. The first of these is the lie in the soul. What happens to someone who arrives at the end of her life and discovers that all the material goods she's been accumulating have not given her happiness, but in fact have led to the further degeneration of the environment that's going to be left for her children. It's important to catch these deceptions early in life because they're less established and easier to question. And more importantly, they are prevented from doing more serious damage when people come to the realization after it's too late that they've been deceived about something that they thought of as essential to their life and how they lived it. The second lie, according to Plato, is the lie in words. This is a constructive deception. A kind of medicine is described by Plato. The allegory of the cave, um, which is also in the Republic, serves as a pretty good example of this kind of lie, a kind of mythology. If you take a look at the image here, what this is basically is society in miniature. We have prisoners in a cave, and all they can see in the cave are shadows up on the wall, projected from a fire that represents society's institutions. These are just shadows of reality. Now, according to Plato, the objective is that you leave the cave. You walk out into the sunlight to find the truth of how the world really works. But that's not where Plato stops. After you do that, after you've come to that realization, you return into the cave and you have the obligation as teachers, this is essentially an allegory for educators, as teachers you should come in and try to make people understand the deceptions that they're suffering. And in this it's very similar to the idea in critical pedagogy. The idea that we have to first recognize the deceptions in society, second, we have to question them. And then thirdly, make an effort to reform society to make the world we all live in a more just place. Thank you.